Good right. morning. First of all, I want to congratulate Jessica. That was a very, very nice talk. And uh, there was a lot of information there, and a lot of information that is hard to find in the history of things. Uh, very little was written about how our education system evolved. It, uh, it was done, and people did it, and worked on it, but nobody wrote it down why, how and why as it went along. And I thought you did a great job putting it together. Uh, I was told that I was going to be filmed this morning. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, it does remind me of a story. I was very active in the Scoliosis Research Society. and We've been going about 15 years. And they said, look, all the guys that really started Scoliosis are getting older. And we better get pictures of them. <laughs> and so they said, you're in charge of the committee. Uh, pick out our three most senior guys and hire a professional photographer and get a picture of it. So we did. I think it was Dr. Mo, uh, Blount, somebody else the first year. Well, unfortunately, uh, two of those guys died that next year. So the next year, I went out to get the next three guys. And the first guy I went up to was my old mentor, Dr. Harrington. And I said, Dr. Harrington, we want to get your picture. He looked at us. No way, he said. Two out of three died last time. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, here we are. What I'd like to give you in this talk is just a little bit of history on this little hymn. I'm not going all the way back to when Themistocles Muck put ivory into the hip of some poor German guy in 1902. Uh, he's credited with the first total hip, but it didn't last. I'm going to try to give you a feel of the development of the modern total hip. I want you to come away understanding a bit about the relationship of orthopedics and industry, which is very unique for our profession compared to, say, urologists and people like that. Uh, I'd like for you to, to just kind of reflect on some of the mistakes that we made through the development of this and how it happened, and for you to have a way to assess what is going to be coming out in the future in the way of implants. So, the surgical option for painful total hip are the same as for any joint in the body, whether it's the little finger, or a big toe, or uh, the hip joint. The options are always arthrodesis, which you see right there, or osteotomy, or arthroplasty. In the 1960s, I started my residency in the mid-60s. Uh, in the 1960s, these were the common options. An arthrodesis of the hip is a very good operation for relieving pain. The patient can walk totally normal with a fused hip. They just can't sit very well. You can only do it unilaterally because you can't function with bilateral total hips. Therefore, it was only useful in unilateral arthritis and inevitably 15 to 20 years after the surgery, the patient's back is shot and their knee is a ball and socket joint. So it was an operation with limited uh, success, but one that we did often because it was an option. Uh, excuse me. Uh, osteotomy, as you know, the history on osteotomy was that since osteoarthritis is usually confined to the weight-bearing part of the joint, if you change the alignment of that joint, perhaps you can get more wear in the future. And the observation was originally made by an English surgeon who had a patient with arthritis of the hip. The patient fractured his hip. He put a, a screw in it, got it to heal, in a little bit different position. The patient said, my pain's kind of gone. So he tried a series of patients cutting the hip and changing the alignment of the femoral head and got moderate success. That operation by the 60s was commonly being done. The problem with it was no matter how we tried to make it so the joint looked better, we'd, we'd manipulate the patient and put their hip in various positions to show the maximum clear space, then we'd do the osteotomy and simulate that. No matter how we did it, if you cut the bone and fixed it, the patient got about five years of pain relief and then they went back to where they were. 
So it was an operation of limited success, but the morbidity wasn't on it wasn't very high. If you had a hip fusion, you were in a hip body spica cast six months. Six months. Uh, so arthroplasty was the cup arthroplasty. This was the absolute gold standard. When I came here in 1969, Dr. Coleman did about one or two of these a week. The thought behind it was that if you imposed a, a cup over a ground head of a femur and a ground out acetabulum, the new bone with motion occurring here, the new bone would form a fibrocartilage surface uh, on each side and the patient would then get some relief of pain and they would do well. <coughs> it was started by Smith Peterson at the Mass General. It's uh, written that he observed in one of his patients when he took a large piece of glass out of their buttock that there was a synovial like membrane around this foreign material. His concept was I'll have a cup <coughs> made of glass I will put it in between the bones and I'll put the patient in traction and let them move their hip for a while. They'll develop the fiber cartilage. I'll take the glass out and then they'll have a functioning joint. Uh, the glass broke. He abandoned the procedure. <laughs> uh, Pyrex came out about that time. Uh, Pyrex was a tougher glass, so he gave it a try. I think he did a total of eight patients with Pyrex. Uh, again, it broke. The next thing he tried was bait bite. Bait bite was just coming out. Bait bite was a plastic. I used to be able to tell you exactly what it was. Bait bite -like was the little <coughs> plastic ashtrays that were beside every bed in the VA where they stubbed out their cigarettes. And I don't know what's in bait bite. -like. I've never seen it since the VA took those ashtrays away. <laughs> but that's what it was. It, he thought it would be biocompatible. He had put it in some dogs and it didn't puss out. Uh, unfortunately, it was not biocompatible. He abandoned that after very few pieces. Industry was working on stainless steels. Stainless steels were being developed primarily for the maritime industry. You'll, you'll realize shortly that nothing has ever been developed for orthopedics. We take what's being developed for a real big industry and we take it and adapt to it. One of the, one of the uh, statuses that we were working on at the time was Vitalium. It was being worked on in the 20s. It became <coughs> available. Uh, he had his first Vitalium cup made and implanted in 1938. It actually worked the way he thought it would work, and he started doing the hip uh, arthroplasty seriously. Cut from old arthroplasty, I'm showing you this patient. This is a, her picture uh, when she was a young juvenile RA. I picked her up in the summer of 69, did a hip on her sometime. This is about a year post-op. She was what I would consider to be the average success. <coughs> this is 1991 when she came <coughs> in some 20 years later to have total, be converted to total hips. She could have had a total hip at any time during that interval, but uh, she was doing well enough that she got along. She walked, walked with either crutches or canes, depending on how she felt, but there had been enough osseous necrosis under that cup, you can see how they settled. And that was the real problem with the cup. Almost inevitably, the head died under the cup. One of the attempts to change that was to go to the Austin Moore prosthesis. The Austin Moore prosthesis was cast of uh, vitalin chrome cobalt in the 1950s for Austin Moore, a uh, surgeon, senior surgeon in South Carolina that ran there, was responsible for their insane asylum. He had a large population of insane patients. When they would bust a, have a femoral neck fracture, uh, he'd pin it, they'd inevitably get up and walk on it, and pull it apart. So he had this made and started using it exclusively in femoral neck fractures in mentally insane patients in South Carolina. People thought, you know, this is a pretty good idea. Maybe we can use this to get around the necrosis of the femoral neck, get the same kind of fiber cartilage on this side of the joint. 
Uh, they decided that this cup, that this stem would have these holes in it so bone could grow through. If you ever have to take one out, it does grow through. You've got to come out of that. But anyhow, he started doing this. People thought this might be the answer. In the 50s, far from the cup. This is a Freddie Thompson prosthesis. I showed both of these prosthesis to you because you're going to see this stem configuration again and again. Freddie Thompson developed this at special surgery exclusively for the arthroplasty <coughs> procedure, the Henny arthroplasty procedure. The issues, though, of both those procedures was the same. You were hospitalized for three months, the first six weeks in traction. How many of you have ever seen balance suspension traction? That's right, I thought. This is balance suspension traction. Uh, this used to be very commonly used. It's designed so when the patient lifts himself up, his buttock comes up without him having to use any force. They can put a bedpan under him and take care of it. It was the standard for a femoral fracture. You put a pin there in line with the, the femur, put traction on it, or in the distal tibial tubercle. You could treat a tibial shaft fracture with a pin in the distal fibula. We didn't do that much. We cast it all the tibia. You could treat, uh, treat a plafond fracture, which was absolutely standard with an oscalsis pin. This was a very standard thing. But to get the result with any of these arthroplasties, you were in this for six weeks. Take it out of it, start it on therapy, go back into it at night, and that was for three months. Even with that, a 50% failure rate defined by I worse now than I was before I had the operation. 50% failure rate. In the best series coming out of special surgery in Iowa, 8 to 12% deep wound infection rate. 50% of the successes required a cane or a crutch the rest of their life. There was obviously an answer, people weren't going to put up with this, so people started looking at the arthroplasty. <coughs> in 1950, McCree Farrar tried a metal-on-metal -metal prosthesis, press fit on both sides, Freddie Thompson stem. Ring tried, and Austin Moore with this acetabulum that was put up uh, the illegal. Why did people wait from 1938 to 1950 to start trying this kind of stuff? World War II. Everybody was working in the world. Every orthopedic surgeon in the world was in World War II. And so it was after World War II that people came back and started working at it. Uh, the Jude brothers in France at the same time dropped on to uh, plexiglass. Plexiglass had just been developed from World War II for the fighter cockpits. Very tough plastic. Uh, looked like it was going to be biocompatible. It is methyl methacrylate, our bone cement, only it's made under very <coughs> high pressure, makes a very long chain, so it makes it strong. He thought it would be an answer. Put in something like 700 of them. Within three years, most of them had broken. Either they eroded or they broke. Pretty violent tissue reaction. Bone cement then started being thought of. And it actually, you and I know it as the liquid and the powder. Uh, it actually in white, that's white because we get it now with barium sulfate in it. When it first came out, barium sulfate was in another vial and you could add it or not. Uh, but, but this cement, self-curing methyl methacrylate, had been used by the neurosurgeons first <coughs> for cranioplasty. And uh, it was a long setting, so the heat that's generated would not be too great, and they could use it uh, to replace bone lost in bone flaps on, on the skull. The first guy to actually use it was Leon Wilsey in Los Angeles. He gave a paper at the Western Orthopedic Association in 1953, uh, where he fixed Freddie Thompson prosthesis in femurs with uh, Duraplast, which uh, was the cranial substitute. Took about 20 to 30 minutes to set. I 
imagine they got kind of bored sitting there waiting on it. But he used it in a few cases. Whether Charlie picked the idea up from him or somewhere else, it's, it's said that he took it, the idea from his neighbor who was making uh, dental appliances for his patients and then the false tooth, that pink stuff, is self-cured methamethacrylate. Uh, he's using it in, where, where he got the idea, whether it was from Wilsey or someone else, I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, he started cementing in the thermal components of Thompson prosthesis. And he got CMW, which was a company in London, to make him fast-setting, self-curing methamethacrylate. His concept was to do a low friction press fit cup. He was going to have a metal stem with a plastic cup. The cup was to be press fit in, was not going to have cement on it, didn't have cement on it. The cup was Teflon. Teflon at that time was a new plastic. Uh, it, had been, it had been used by plastic surgeons and chin implants. There had been one heart valve out with it. There had been no tissue reactions with it. He thought it was a good material to use, uh, and so he started using it. He had some problems. He had some real problems. One is, at that time, in England, there was not a single orthopedic manufacturer that could make anything out of uh, chrome cobalt. So all it could get was a cast stainless steel stem. Cast stainless is significantly weaker than cast chrome cobalt. Uh, he elected the Teflon. He thought that was a good idea. He had a 27% infection rate. He was operating in a, in a rundown hospital in Manchester. He was the <coughs> low man on the totem pole in the professorships at, uh, in England. And his hospital was at its difficulties. The real issue is, which shows his perseverance, he did 285 of his initial Teflon hips in two to four years, he had had 225 of them fail, all having to be surgically removed, all with massive, massive reaction. As the Teflon wore rapidly, it caused an osteolysis in the hip that nobody had ever seen. It was an unbelievable catastrophe. And people talked about it, and uh, it it really probably would have set everyone else in the world back and they would never have done another hit. Uh, Sir John simply said, I have the right idea and the wrong material, and went forward. He, but he was a man of, of great forward <coughs> foresight. He was having to deal with a weak material. He did a lot of studies on the hip, published them, talked about them. He really got us thinking about the biomechanics of the hip. He got us thinking about the lever arms across the hip, that if you increase the abductor lever arm, decrease the body weight lever arm, the load coming down is less. Uh, he was the first one to start talking about head and neck ratio. He realized that if he was going to have a small, the, the size of the cup is limited by the anatomy. If he wants more plastic, he's got to have a smaller head. But if he has a smaller head, he has more chance of impingement dislocation. He realized all of those things. Um, an amazing surgeon. And he promoted things to make his way work. He started promoting uh, laminar flow clean air room. This was technology that had come out in World War II for the manufacture of the atomic weapons. It had been applied in the 50s to uh, the pharmaceutical <laughs> industry to manufacture penicillin and the pharmaceuticals. He applied it in the operating room to try to get that infection rate down. He started using the space suit. He was the guy that did it to try to get that infection rate down. He said, I have to know where the pelvis is to be able to put that little cup in an exact position. Therefore, I'll do it. The patient's in a spine position, a lateral approach to the trochanteric osteotomy. The trochanteric osteotomy was not only necessary for the <coughs> approach, but it allowed him to increase the abductor lever arm. He designed instruments that allowed him to, to take the, the normal center of rotation of the hip and move it inward. He very much promoted a hip reconstruction, not a hip replacement. He started operating and restricted people in his operating rooms. In his 
contained area, he allowed only himself, his assistant, and his nurse. Uh, he sat, the assistant stood across the table and retracted for him, and the nurse handed him things. He did not want a splash basin anywhere in the room. He thought they were contaminants. Uh, so all, all instruments came in. His approach instruments came in. He used them once. They went out, uh, and they went out through kind of a little passageway. Uh, nobody came in that room uh, and disturbed his clean air. By the time Charnley had finished with his series of hits, and the European people were looking at it, there was a general kind of groupthink in orthopedics by the end of the 60s. That metal, as we were using it, was pretty good. Plastic, as Teflon, was pretty bad. And that fixation was going to be solved with polymethyl methacrylate. <coughs> that was kind of where we were. People were ready to start doing something. So one of the concepts was let's cement in the McKee for our hip. That's actually the first, not this particular but the McKee Farrar, that's the first total hip I saw done. I saw McKee Farrar do it in Houston in 1967. Uh, then one of the guys in my program was interested, and we did a couple of them uh, at the county hospital. And, you know, they did pretty well, very well. Uh, I need to talk to you a little bit about, though, about what the state of the orthopedic industry was in the late 60s. These were the principal companies. They were all privately owned. They were all extremely small. They had very few support engineers in them. Implants was a minor business. They were primarily making traction equipment, making components for braces uh, because of the polio epidemic. They were primarily making a lot of slings, that sort of thing. They, they did make hip nails, small plates, for fractures of the forearm, screws for ankle fractures, Steinman pins. We were just starting to get femoral nails, uh, so they were making those out of, out of uh, stainless. But mainly, most of them were working with stainless steel. Almeda and Zimmer were casting chrome cobalt, but in very limited quantities. And when they made a prosthesis like an Austin Moore or Freddie Thompson, uh, those were virtually handmade by one machinist. And uh, so it was really a fairly small, unsophisticated group. And implants were an extremely small part of the business. And there was no regulation on implants other than good manufacturing principles. That McKee Farrar, that was handmade to its component. There were, they were not interchangeable. So these were very uh, custom-made implants, highly expensive, $400. The Charlie Mueller came to us in 1970. The Charlie Mueller, Mueller was a big name in Switzerland, uh, started the AO group, all that stuff. He had thought and observed the last bit of Charlie's work when he started using high-density polyethylene for the cup and was starting to get good success. So he, he thought he was doing a favor when he brought this prosthesis out from Protec and had Charnley's name put on the front of it. And they called it the Charnley Mueller. It highly offended Dr. Charnley, and uh, the two guys almost didn't speak for 10 years. Then they became very, very close friends. But uh, it, it, this was a kind of a very popular European prosthesis in 1970 and came to the United States at that time. Uh, I became interested in it. I started with McKee Farrar, uh, quickly decided that, that that metal on metal was not going to work mainly because we were starting to see loosening in the Ashtagra components because of the way the components made it. And I had tried initially with the anterior approach and then the transteric approach and then learned the posterior lateral approach uh, from a fellow at Northwestern and uh, started pretty much in earnest in 1970, <coughs> about the spring of 70, doing these kind of total hips. And they were mainly charming uter total hips do, done through a posterior approach. 
still in 1971, 72, across the country, the cup arthroplasty was the operation. But it didn't take long at all. These patients could actually be in the hospital a week and up and walking and you know right away. It was it was almost miraculous. So the swing in the country went to the total hip as you see it here. In the fall of 1970, the uh, cement was declared a drug. This happened because that summer there were four incidences of intraoperative death. At noted at the time that the surgeons put the cement into the femoral component, uh, the patient would suddenly have cardiovascular collapse. And in that era, the primary anesthesia was cyclopropane. They usually ran cyclo patients a little dry uh, because they had problems with, with uh, fluid retention. And these patients, if they had any kind of cardiovascular problem, were set up for sudden collapse. Four deaths. The anesthesiologist reported, and it was true, you could you could do it today. You go up and smell what's coming out of the endotracheal tube on a patient. When you put that semen in the femur, you can smell the semen coming out of the endotracheal tube. It goes into circulation, and the monitor comes out. You can smell it. I mean, it's, some of it is eliminated in the lung. The FDA said, this is a drug. This is not an implant, and therefore, we're going to regulate it. Uh, they stopped the importation and told CMW, the only company making the cement, you have to apply for approval. This meant that CMW had to reveal their trade secrets. This kind of a plastic, you can, you know what's in it. You know, it's polyethylene lac methacrylate is the ground up is the solid. It's got some benzoyl peroxide to kick it off. Uh, it's got an inhibitor in uh, endimethylperitoluidine, but the proportions of those, and especially the plasticizer, are considered trade secrets. That's what makes it react reliable. And if they, if they revealed it, then everybody would know. CMW said, look, you may be the American FDA, but we're so busy, we can't even keep up with our orders worldwide. We're not telling you. So no, we're not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> this stopped the importation of the cement into the U.S. And I mean, there was an open revolt. By this time, around the country, everybody with hip problems was looking for <coughs> their total hips. They went to their senators. They went to their representatives. They went to everybody and said, you know, the FDA is causing us real trouble. The Academy uh, was trying to negotiate this. Uh, it was caused some real political consternation for a little bit uh, late in 1970. The FDA, quote, capitulated, but it wasn't full capitulation. They said, we will allow the use to investigators who apply to us and get a number. And you might think that's honors, and a lot of people did. But uh, they would only allow it in one center, one metropolitan area. Uh, it was not awarded based on any merit. I applied, and as best I could tell, it was first come, first served, because I got the number, and I was the number here in, in Salt Lake City and could use it. Other guys in town couldn't use it. There were some very good surgeons in town. This was the situation all around the U.S., and it caused a lot of hard feelings, but uh, it happened. The FDA did stop the cement from coming in. They said the only requirement to use it was you had the number and you could only use it in patients over 70 and you had to tell them if somebody died intraoperative. That was it. And so they, this was going to be their study of the drug. Uh, this lasted for a little while. It caused a lot of people to start using a modification of this prosthesis. Uh, in here in, in Salt Lake there were several hundred of these put in. Patients got fairly good relief. It's metal on metal. It's press fit on both sides, but inevitably both sides got loose or one of both sides got loose. Oddly enough, we did not see that much damage from the metal on metal in these. 
The FDA declared a cement, declared uh, the cement a drug, but they had a general release within two years because of political pressure. It was just too much. This was primarily negotiated with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons said, look, we'll get <coughs> surgeons geared up on how to use this so you don't have that kind of problem. Uh, and there was never really a study done the way most drug studies are done on nothing like that. Right. The uh, East Center, like our center, was required to run a course on it. We did. We had several courses here at the U. We had a lot of guys come in and scrub with us for a fair amount of time. And uh, people started using it and started using it a lot. It really total hit <laughs> by 72, 73 were widely done throughout the U.S. and it was a gorgeous honeymoon period. Uh, you got great results, patients looked pretty good. We were using a, a instruments that were modified Charlie instruments and uh, <coughs> let us do a hit uh, as you see it here. But we started to see some problems. Uh, we started to see a few hips fracture, uh, patients like this. <coughs> In 1973, Congress had been wanting to regulate orthopedic implants for a long time. The orthopedic community and the orthopedic industry had really been holding them off. But with the breakage of stems, the onset of some big lawsuits, Congress went ahead and legislated that the FDA regulate orthopedic devices. This caused a lot of consternation. The orthopedic industry had never been regulated and now they were going to be, and they really resent, but it was coming. The FDA responded, they requested somebody make a proposal on how to evaluate orthopedic implants. They put out an RFP, uh, Dan Daniels, who was a PhD working over at the Heart Institute, and I had been working on various projects together. We were wanting to establish an orthopedic lab. We were looking for something to do. We put together a proposal and got the RFP to do an implant retrieval study. The proposal was that we would collect all of the implants in Salt Lake City uh, that were taken out over a one year period of time. We would look at them for quality and other things. We would compare them to new implants by ordering implants. At that time in the orthopedic residency, there were two residents, or three, here at the University <coughs> Hospital. And then we had one or two residents at Holy Cross, St. Mark's, VA, six at LD. So every hospital, three of us, every hospital was covered with orthopedic residents from our program. And so the residents, at the end of every day, gathered up all the implants that had been taken out, whether it was a Steinman pen, femoral nail, no matter what it was, brought it back to the lab and over at UBTL, and we started the analysis on it. Uh, we got a lot of interesting implants back. This is one of them. This was a cast, vectal hip uh, that had broken, and it was very easy to see why when we compared it to a new hip. On all of these hips, you could see where they put that stem in the vise, the guy that made it, put it in the vise to polish the head. On a cast stainless, the pressure of the vise caused pressure point because it set it up 15 fractures. Uh, this is a femoral nail that was uh, taken out. 10 extra points, who can name that? Anybody in the audience? It's a Jewett nail. This was the common hip fixation device through about 1981. Jewett nail. Well, you can see that this is a very lightweight lady. Very lightweight patient. Uh, you can see it bending. It broke. This is what it looked like. When you looked at this and compared it to the new one, there was no fatigue. There was a fatigue fracture there. Yes, that's true. But there was nothing wrong with the metal. There was nothing wrong with the metallurgy. This is just a failure of union. And you're going to see a fer uh, fracture in the implant when the bone does. <coughs> so this is, there's nothing wrong with this implant. We took out Steinman pins as well. <laughs> it was really, a, this, we never found any flaws in the Steinman pins that were being used. But it was real interesting. The company that made this <coughs> packaged it, and then in order to keep it from punching through 
their little plastic seal, they put a, an envelope on the end of it, just a little envelope, put it on it, and glued it with horsehide glue. And if you look at in these threads, there was horsehide glue. And there was horsehide glue in the ones that we took out of patients. We had been implanting horsehide glue for a long time just because they didn't clean this thing at the very end. Whether we were seeing bad reactions with it, we don't know, but it was just a failure <coughs> package. So the conclusions of our study were the materials were very good, but manufactured generally good. Uh -oh, the wrong thing. And the labeling was very poor and everything, and the packaging was poor. Out of all this, we came up with a classification for orthopedic devices. This was not ours alone. This was a joint project with the FDA, with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, with the orthopedic manufacturers. There's a lot of politics in this. But basically, we decided that we would classify braces, tools, jigs, guides, anything we use in surgery that doesn't end up being in the patient by good manufacturing principles. That was all you really needed to do and regulate with that. That existing implants and implants that were made like new implants that were essentially equivalent and safe would be class two. These would not require new drug-like approval. And there's a lot of politics in this. You might say, well, why should you be able to bring out a quote new hip? You're bringing out a uh, Joe Blow's <coughs> hip as opposed to the Freddie Thompson hip. Well, if it looked about the same, it allowed a new company to start and by allowing this, you were not restraining trade and restraining the production of orthopedic implants to just the existing manufacturers. It allowed for new people to come on board. But new implants, anything that was essentially not the same as what was existing in 1973, four, had to be proven safe and effective. This seemed like a good compromise to pretty much everyone. The question then became, who writes the regulations? Well, the answer is the government does unless. And this is a this is legislation that occurred in the late 1800s uh, related to the problems they were having with railroads. They had to have some way to standardize uh, train wheels and steel and <coughs> rails and at that time it was decided that the government wouldn't be a good one to do it unless no one else would. But if there was a voluntary organization form that represented all interested parties uh, and that they would arrive at decisions by consensus that they could establish the regulations for an industry. And in the case of uh, orthopedics, the instrument parties were the manufacturers, Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the pub, uh, and the FDA. There was an organization in existence, the American Society for Testing Material. If you look on a lot of things you have, you'll see ASTM on it. It's there for electrical stuff, it's there for ski bindings, it's there for danger everything. Their committee, F4, was for materials. They had already worked on stainless steel, chrome cobalt. They looked like the right place to set the regulations. The Academy put uh, the bioengineering committee in charge of this. Uh, and we started writing the regulations. I, I happened to be head of that engineering committee, and, and we handled those for in the first 10 years. Uh, the 1970 though was really a decade of change for orthopedic surgeons. Subspecialty <laughs> began. Biomechanics became the dominant basic science. Pathology had been it up until that point in time. But now then all of a sudden biomechanics is becoming the thing. Research started gaining attention. The Orthopedic Research Society started being filled with orthopedic surgeons watching what was happening. Uh, we started seeing papers, instead of looking at a case like this, you see that 
looks like it's a pretty well cemented hip. In those days, we put the cement in by stuffing it down the, the femur with our finger, uh, so it didn't go in quite uniformly, but that, that doesn't look bad. Uh, then you can see all of a sudden some osteolysis of bone right there. It got worse. By this time, the end of the stem is pretty well potted, and it's going to fatigue and break. You started seeing research coming out in the Orthopedic Research Society, looking at the forces in the stem, the strains in the femur, how implant design affected this, how position affected it, how the material that the stem was made of affected it. So we started to see a relationship developing about implant design and biological response to them. Stems were evaluated for what their effect was. We also tried on our own to solve this problem. Most of our problems in that honeymoon period uh, in the late <coughs> 70s that we saw, the S tablets were doing okay. We hadn't, they hadn't been in long enough for us to see where. The stems were loosening and the stems were breaking. So in 1976, the first attempt started coming out at a resurfacing total hip. It was cemented metal cap with a cemented acetabular liner. Uh, there were two or three places doing it, and uh, some of us were very enthusiastic for it. Uh, I got interested in it. Uh, Dr. Coleman said, you know, I think you're going to have trouble with options process under it. I think it's going to be no different than cut. Uh, but people were reporting good results. Uh, Wagner in, in Germany was reporting great results. He and, and Dr. Coleman were good friends. Dr. Coleman arranged for me to go over and spend uh, three weeks with him and watch him do a bunch of them. And uh, they looked good. And I came home and tried them. This is a patient that uh, had it in. And you can see from bilateral. But it failed, and it failed from osseous necrosis under the cup, just like he predicted. And I had to convert it to totals. I did 17 of these. I had to convert 60. I have one still out there walking around. Across the country, it was a disaster, uh, mainly from osseous necrosis, but there was a lot of other problems. Instrumentation wasn't ideal for it. Some people nicked the neck and got fractured. But basically, we had a pretty good run at resurfacing in the 70s and abandoned it, except Harlan Amstutz persisted with it and stayed on it and perfected it in his hands. It was also a decade of change for the industry. The implants were very, very profitable. All of the mom and pop orthopedic companies were bought up by big pharma. Uh, Bristol Myers bought Zimmer. Uh, Pfizer, I think Pfizer got Halmedica. Uh, every one of the big companies got bought by Big Pharma, and Big Pharma put money into it. The budgets went way, way up. So very sophisticated engineering, manufacturing became part of orthopedics. Uh, at that point, up until that point, when it was a mom and shop operation, an orthopedic surgeon would have an idea for an implant, scratch it out, take it in and say, would you guys make this? And make it. All of a sudden, though, you had the engineers from the company forming design teams with implanting surgeons, guys that were interested in implants, had biomechanical knowledge, maybe had their own <clears throat> biomechanics labs at home. Guys that were really interested in developing implants were teaming up as a team with industry to start implant designs. We also, industry got its first big lawsuits. Up until that point in time, an implant broke, the company might pay somebody 10,000, 40,000, they went out. I mean, I, I can remember when the first $400,000 lawsuit hit one of the companies. It just was, it was devastating. They thought the end of the world was coming. The companies responded to all of this by changing things. The cast chrome cobalt that was in the, the original Frey Thompson stem was really quite good and quite adequate. But it definitely could be made better if you had very expensive, sophisticated equipment 
where you could beat it and heat it, forge it, to make it the crystal smaller and make it stronger. You, it was, you could show it was stronger, quote, better. Was it better in the patient? <coughs> we weren't having any problems with them in the first place when they were done right. Yeah, so it, yeah, yeah, it was kind of an answer, but it, uh, it was definitely overkill. Uh, the computer-assisted design, computers were just coming out. Computer-assisted design was a very neat thing, marketing tool. So we came out with computer-assisted designs, which just meant you had a big, heavier, fatter stem that made stress in the femur more shielding. Uh, but we got those from industry, and it protected industry. We also got a definite decrease in the neck shaft angle from normal. Whereas we used to have hips that had a pretty good neck shaft angle, we went into this era when we had relatively small neck, uh, neck shaft angles. It definitely decreased the stress in the stem and was going to protect them from breaking and protect against lawsuits. It also made it much harder for the abductors to work. It also made it much higher incidence of dislocation in the hip, but it was protecting uh, something. About this time, we went into the area of people looking at semen disease. We started seeing in, in hips that were failing all of this osteolysis around the hip. And if you took a tissue sample of this, processed it, looked at it under H&E, all you saw was cement particles. This was semen disease. And it was especially prominent in knees, we'll talk about later. But it was the response to it was, the Pew came out with their AML, which was just an Austin Moore prosthesis that had been filled in and poor coated. Uh, they're, they're coating on the surface. They were going for a bioingrowth. They've been seeing bioingrowth studies being shown at the Orthopedic Research Society. Uh, it looked like it was a clinical thing to do. How Medica came out with their beaded surface, or, or started playing with their beaded surface at this time. These were technically challenging things for industry to make. To get this bead to stick on, after you had made the stem, you had to put it back in the furnace and heat it quick enough that the beads melted because of their surface area. They absorbed the heat quicker. They melted, ran together, ran into the, the surface layer of the stem before the stem heated up enough to plastically deform. So manufacturing was a real challenge with these. <coughs> Zimmer responded with its uh, uh, fiber metal. This was George Galante. Zimmer's problem was that they were playing with titanium, which they thought was more biocompatible, but in titanium, titanium is very not sensitive, and if they took their rack, their pads all the way around, it made the stem too weak uh, here and here. So they had these little pads on it, and they were having a tough time getting the pads to stick properly. But a lot of development occurred. They, the, the companies were responding with some, some very sophisticated manufacturing techniques. And uh, they, they did improve their coatings. We started seeing less shedding. But during this, the implant companies, the, the FDA was saying, gentlemen, these are not essentially equivalent to the class two Freddie Thompson stem and the AML stem. These stems are different. These need to come under class three. They need to be a new implant. And then when they told the manufacturers what it would take to have a study for a class three implant, they made it like what they had evolved for drugs by that point in time. And that was, you know, you need to do a, a blinded study match pair surgeons and the company said we can't do this so they went the companies continued to improve their products uh, they did things like diffusion bonding very sophisticated stuff to make things better but the war really began <coughs> between 
the manufacturers and the FDA and advertising related implants. Is it new and pre-existing or not? Is it essentially equivalent? Or does it need to drop down here and be proven safe and effective? The companies went the route of saying, we will not advertise that these should be used cementless. We're just saying they're a thermal stem. You use them the way you want them. You surgeons, if you want to put them in. But then they ran courses. We all ran courses showing you how to do it cementless. There was a lot of conflict here. Uh, we got out of it by the academy getting active with it. The, the academy said, okay, guys, you can't advertise at the academy. That was a big deal. Uh, they said to the surgeons, uh, you can't be going around the country saying you can do this stuff cementless. They said to the FDA, if these guys will stop doing it on the existing implants, will you let them come in grandfathered under the, as a class two implant? The FDA capitulated and the, after the academy's negotiations and then it, it happened. Uh, and so they, that little issue would have resolved in a couple of years. But the thing that we saw happening in the, in the 80s was this stuff, but let's get this product out of the academy. And I'm telling you, I think this is one of the worst things that happened to us in orthopedics. The development of implant teams was good, but what hot happened with this was not the issue, was a bad issue. What happened was engineers and developing surgeons would design implants, <coughs> we'd do some very good static and dynamic testing on them, we'd try them in cadavers, and then we'd do a few cases, but the implant had to be released for sale by the next academy because that's where the money was. And it was big money. And so we saw this push happen. We probably could have done better if in that original negotiation that we had said class two, class three implants should have some kind of follow-up, one year, two year, three year follow-up. But it doesn't have to be like a drug study. It doesn't have to be matched <laughs> cases. Just show us that in it doesn't break in three years when it's put in a human, or it doesn't cause bad. But that didn't happen. Uh, by the time that all of this was negotiated, the manufacturing process on most of the implants had gotten pretty good, and we were not seeing failures of the main body of implants. We were seeing failures of, of surgeons not knowing how to put a cementless hip in. They wouldn't put it in tight enough. So there was some loosening. The honeymoon period for the cementless fixation was going away. We were starting to see some failure. We also had some manufactured products that didn't quite come out the way they should have. This one was a titanium product. They put a titanium head on it. It caused a lot of problems. Uh, and so people started thinking maybe this cementless stuff isn't as good as we thought. Uh, that academy came to the rescue on that business of advertising. Also about this time, we started to realize that cementless disease was not cementless disease. Cementless disease was particle disease. Granted, we only saw on H&E sections cement in this tissue, but that was because the polyethylene was dissolved by the processing of the tissue to make the slice that you looked at under the microscope. When you looked at it by other techniques, by far the biggest particle there was polyethylene particle. So when we started really looking at it, it was the polyethylene that was causing the problem. Cement to some degree, but polyethylene much more so. And so we started seeing particle disease and recognizing it as such. The combination of the problems with the uh, that, along with the fact that we're now getting the AML prosthesis is bet out for uh, 20, uh, 15, 20 years by this time, they were being well fixed distally, but up here there was tremendous stress shielding. I mean, look, that is that's paper thin bone. <coughs> the patient didn't feel bad. The patient was walking well. The patient was doing well, but this looked like a catastrophe waiting to happen. Surgeons really got 
fearful of what was happening to the bone above the bioengrowth area where it was seeing stress shield. There were some very good, sophisticated studies done by the, the primary surgeons. Uh, Charlie Ying was the primary surgeon in this, he was the champion for the AML STEM. He showed these results. He was right up front about it. He did some nice studies in uh, the company showing that the stiffness of the stem was related to the radius of the stem, the fifth factor. So a small stem was significantly less stiff than a big stem. And when you looked at the series, the little stems didn't have near as much stress shielding as a big stem. <coughs> but it took the big stems to go and patients were big feet. So in the early 90s, we had this thought that maybe cement wasn't so bad after cement. We actually saw this swing back to cement. And we went to what's called a hybrid, where we used a cementless acetabulum and a cemented stem, and we looked at how were we cement. The old days, when I did a, a femur, you know, a femur was there, we put this little polyethylene tube in, stuffed the cement down, the blood went out the other way, that was good enough, pull it out, put the stem in, go on your way. Well, I said, no, a better way to do it is let's clean the canal very thoroughly, let's plug it at the end with something, let's put the cement down by injection and backfill it all the way up, uh, let's improve the cement, take all of the little bubbles that developed in it out by centrifuging or vacuum mixing it, and then after we get the cement in, let's put a pressure gun on it and pressure it, so we pressure it out into the interstices of the bone, and then when we ram the stem down to make sure it sits in the middle of the cement mantle, let's put little things on cement devices on the implant and on the end of it so it goes down and stays perfectly centered and the surgeon is responsible for holding it that way. All of these things, third, fourth generation cementing techniques, came out and we tried them in the early uh, 90s and it was this, the hybrid stem, and they did well, they did pretty well. Uh, but the problem was that when we looked at them, we were starting to see some radiolucent lines, uh, maybe 90, 95% of patients were happy, five, seven, eight percent weren't. Uh, the stem fixation looked like it was 90% successful in our hands. Why in the American's hands? The stem fixation was not as good as it was in English hands, I don't know. The English have always published better results. When I've traveled in England and I've seen their results, they look, they look good. Uh, I went to New Zealand where all the surgeons trained, <coughs> all did the turn of the hip. Their, their cementing technique looked just like mine. <coughs> it looked very good. And I didn't get the results in English guys. The, 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 the guys in New Zealand did. The guys in Australia did. The guys in Europe did. But I think the English guys were honest. And I watched them, and I don't know, they just, they, they did cement better than us. We tried a second time to do it better, we didn't. Uh, it was a real enthusiasm uh, for cemented stems, uh, but it didn't last long. And there was a lot of reasons for it. This happened to be a, I happened to work on this stem. It was no better than the other stems of the other era. It did work well though. And, and the stems, the Hymetica stem, Zimmer stem, uh, the Pew stem, the stems that we were looking at were well manufactured, put in in the 80s. By the 90s when we were doing that cement project, we were starting to pick up the long-term results of it. This is a 16-year-old girl who had a failed uh, figure of graph for osseous necrosis. Absolutely, she's no candidate for an osteotomy. She's no candidate for a hip fusion. I did anatomics on her. Uh, this is her, I don't know, some years later, six years later. I still get Christmas cards from this girl. Uh, she's, I think Chris is, one of you guys has her now. She's had the polyethylene exchanged on both sides, and I think one of the cups exchanged. Both stems are still in her. She's had three kids now, and is really doing quite well. If you look at the survivorship of the original series, they were really good. They were excellent. The femoral stem survivorship 
was better than anything we had gotten with cement or when we went back for another try of cement that we got with cement. So by the end of this study section in the late 90s, I think we pretty well have decided cement is gone for means of fixation. Where in particle disease became the problem of the 90s, uh, you can see in this hip the thickness of the acetabulum there and here. There's definitely wear in that polyethylene. We know that those wear particles have the potential to give us troubles. Uh, particle disease with osteolysis was a real focus in the 90s of papers and talks and discussions. There have been a lot of attempts to improve the polyethylene. This was an attempt in the knee. They did try the hip also. Uh, it didn't work. They put in fibrocarbon to reinforce the cup, to reinforce the polyethylene. It was not good at all. <coughs> uh, direct compression molded surfaces were good, but one of the companies came out with a heat pressed surface that looked nice and shiny, and it wore like mad. It caused a real problem. These problems were not just theoretical. I mean, surgeons were feeling these. Those of us that were doing were having to revise these damn things. So the, the community was seeing bad results with, quote, improved polyethylene. Then we had something that was really unusual. DuPont, which here for said, I'll never, they would never allow any of their implants in orthopedics. He said, we don't want our plastic going anywhere near. One of the, the story goes, and I think you heard it, I heard it from not the guy, but the guy close to him. One of the company presidents made an appointment to go to DuPont and met in corporate headquarters with the head of DuPont and said, we want you to make our polyethylene. We want a better polyethylene. And this was back in about 1980. <laughs> and the guy said, I'll never be. He said, look out there. He was, he was, they were in the, the manufacturing facility. There was a great car, train car out there with train cars on it. He said, see out there? He said, that's, poly, that's loads of polyethylene going out of here for industry. He said, there's more polyethylene in one of those cars than I'll ever produce for orthopedics, could ever produce and sell to orthopedics. I have zero liability on that pile of polyethylene going out the door. He said, I, I sell you one little carton of polyethylene and I could get a million dollar loss. No way. You can't have polyethylene. And even though we did get DuPont made polyethylene, they had to go through a third party that changed the name on it. And DuPont took their cell off. But then all of a sudden, they said, we are going to make a better polyethylene, and we're going to venture with DuPont. And when DuPont put their name with DuPont, Orthopedics really responded. We thought this was going to be good, and it had some good basic science behind it. It was prepared under high temperature and pressure. It changed the crystal structure, it made the chain go better, increased it, all these things. It looked good, and it was promoted hard, and people wanted it. And the work particles were extremely osteolytic, and it was taken off the market. And it left a sour taste in everybody's mouth. At about this time, at Mass General, people were playing highly cross on polyethylene. It had been observed in some cups that were made in, in Japan. One of the surgeons over there was making a small cup for his Japanese patients that he couldn't get made in the U.S. And the only way he could sterilize it was to send it down to his physics lab. And they used extremely intense irradiation to sterilize it. And the intense irradiation crosslinked polyethylene. This was in the very early 1980s that he did it. And then he observed in the 90s, I'm not seeing any wear in these. And that was taken over by the group at uh, MIT, and they developed cross polyethylene, <coughs> and they started reporting really good results. And all the lab looked good, and all of the simulation studies looked good. And everybody said, you've told us this before. We've been here a lot of times. We've heard how wonderful your polyethylene is, and we're just not going with it. So we saw a swing to alternates in the late 90s with an interest in metal on metal and ceramic on ceramic. Uh, I personally thought that was really, really good. We've been looking at ceramic 
for a long time, uh, certainly from the point of view of where. It's an amazing thing. The problem is that most of it has always been used in heavy industry and in the brewing industry where a lot of money can go into making it and those people weren't manufacturing it for orthopedics. And this is what it looked like we may have a few problems with it and ended up doing it. But this hip came out at the time when advertising direct to the public was released to the medical industry. And when you first started seeing ads for medicines that are going to cure everything, they didn't give you. Uh, those silly ads started coming out. But this one came out for this total hip. And this total hip was put in uh, Jack Nicholas. And Jack Nicholas advertised on TV for this hip. And everybody that came into the office, I want a hip like Jack Nicholas, especially for me to play golf. The problem with it was that we didn't realize that when you walk, when you're in single leg stance, your hip actually, the artificial hip actually uh, subluxes very slightly, and a gap develops. And when you hit, you go into weight bearing, it comes back together. That had never been a problem. We'd never noticed it in the metal on metals. We certainly hadn't noticed it in the metal on ethylene. These patients noted it because when it came back together, they got a little click. Click, click. And you, so you started going to meetings and guys say, I'm not sure this ceramic's good. They'd pull out their little tape recorder and put it up to the microphone and say, This is my patient walking down the hall. Click, 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 click. And that kind of killed it. Also, there were some fractures of the head. It had to be put in just right. It enjoyed a life for a while, and it's still being used. And I think, <coughs> under the right circumstances, it might have a real place in the future. Metal on metal is a different story. Metal on metal was being widely used in Europe in the late uh, mid, mid 80s, started in the late 80s, really got popular. And so the Europeans said, look, we're using this, it's doing well. You guys used this back in the 70s and you, nobody got cancer and died. So why not go to metal on metal? Well, one of the things that, that had come out was the patients that had this in it had extremely high chrome cobalt levels in their bloodstream. Uh, the Europeans have a different way of looking at results. If a patient doesn't come back and complain, they're doing well. <laughs> they go to you and complain. So if they don't come back to my center and tell me I'm not doing well, then they're a good result. Uh, you really got to watch the results of that type when they're coming out of Europe. And it, it may be improving. I don't know. Jeremy can tell us where it is or not. But back in my day, that was a problem. But they said, you know, we're not having any problems with metal on metal. It's the best alternative out there. And they've already told you that they've got a better plastic, but I'm not sure it is. So about 2000, the decision was having to be made by all of us that were doing hips. What are you going to do? Are you going to go with the new highly cross-linked polyethylene, or are you going to go with metal on metal, or are you going to go with ceramic? I elected to go with, with plastic. I'm glad I did. <laughs> uh, my last decade of active surgery was 2000, 2010. <clears throat> I kind of call this the, the silly series. I mean, we went through two incision surgery, a posterior incision, the anterior tabial, computer assisted. All of these things, these three especially, were going to make patients get well so much quicker and out of the hospital that surgeons would do them and the results were walking them out of the hospital at night. It had absolutely nothing to do with the incision. It was the anesthesia. The poor damn anesthesiologists were doing all the good, and we were getting all the credit. But uh, I don't know that these made all that much difference. Uh, this certainly hadn't. Uh, so I'll conclude with this is a slide from 2010, a talk very similar to this, which I gave my opinion of the state of the art in 2010. I thought cementless fixation was here to stay. I thought that the metal was on cross poly, cross poly was the surface. I did not put ceramic in there because I just thought it was too expensive and not worth it. I uh, thought standardly femoral stems were the way to go. Mayo Clinic was just coming out with their little silly 
stem saying that the lack of the last two centimeters was going to save some kind of bone in the future? Bullshit. Uh, the wound still heals side to side, not in the end. And I, I tell you, the concept of making a little bitty incision and putting two poor medical students, dragging as hard as they can in both directions, and traumatizing that tissue to the nth degree, and then trying to cram an a, a implant in there, and think that that wound is a better wound than a wound that would have been of adequate size. Tissue trauma is not talked about enough. When we talk about comorbidities, they talk about the comorbidity of obesity, the comorbidity of diabetes, of age. What about the comorbidity of the surgeon? What about the comorbidity of somebody that takes a bovie and sees a little bleeder and, goes, <laughs> and kills a pea-sized piece of tissue that becomes perfect medium for bacteria to grow? Anybody that has looked at surgery knows the principles. I wish I had been smart enough to state them. But Halstead stated them in the 1900s. You know, handle tissue well. Dead tissue is a growth media for bacteria. You don't beat tissue up. You don't handle it with a great big forcep that looks like a garden. You handle it with adsense, with little you handle tissue like a surgeon. And I still believe in this, and I'll stand by it. Uh, I think the current implants are excellent, so don't try something new without significant follow -up. Don't be the first to new to try the last <coughs> one you build the sun. I rationalize myself for having jumped on things quickly because it was at a time when we were seeing very significant failure. I needed an implant for young patients, and the semen and stem wasn't it. But I don't think in this day and age that there is a crying clinical problem out there for us to solve. You may have some economic issues. You may have some other issues out there, but it's not, there's not a crying need for a new so I'd say, yeah, go into the implant business, uh, but help develop them, it's a good idea, but I think for the general public, make sure there's something you can follow before you jump on it. Thank you very much. I'm not kidding. So for the rest of the time, just say, the biggest thing on it, just knowing history of stuff just helps you when you're relating with industry and when you're getting out there and making decisions on what to put in. And if you see all the stuff that we've gone through in, in the last decade of what I've been working in, but just all the things that have gone to crap had all been done before and not worked well before. And it's industry that pushes the stuff down your throat to say, oh, this is what you got to do is because it's solving some problem that really doesn't exist. You know, I mean, metal on metal was there that, uh, oh man, wear rates are going to be way better in this location rates are going to be, but if you put the hip in well and you pay attention to what you're doing, this location rates are pretty damn low. The wear rates, <coughs> you can just put in crosslink poly now and metal or ceramic and wear rates are pretty darn low. And, Knowing history helps you make good decisions, and I think all of the points that be in there, I think you should take a picture of it, hang up in your office. When you make We've got some industry representative here, and some, they're close friends. Sylvia and I have worked together longer than either one of us wants to do this. <laughs> <laughs> she started uh, as a scrub tech for Wally Hess, who was probably the, one of the best tip surgeons I've ever known, and a great guy, practiced over that. <coughs> Uh, Aaron Hoffman's daughter, who's running his companies here. I see they got some of their people. You guys want to rebut anything? I think, I think it, you know, that's the way it was, guys. <laughs> Not all industries best. No, 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 what you're doing. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>